So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. This morning, CPSC staff will brief the commission on a draft final rule to establish a consumer product safety standard for infant sleep products. This draft rule arises under Section 104 of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, also known as the Danny Kayser Child Product Safety Notification Act, or Danny's Law, in shorthand to most of us. Uh, this act honors Danny as a child who died in an infant product that had been the subject of two recalls, uh, but the product somehow remained on the market. Danny's name reminds us how precious life is and how dedicated we must be to safeguard it to the greatest extent possible. Pursuant to Section 104, the Infant Sleep Products Draft Rule will incorporate by reference the voluntary standard ASTM 118-17A as a mandatory standard with modifications to make the standard more stringent, stringent to further reduce the risk of injury associated with flat and inclined sleep products. The draft rule does two other things. First, it amends the commission's regulation regarding third-party conformity assessment bodies to include the infant sleep products standard in the list of notices of requirements issued by the commission. And that's something we do every time we issue a new standard. And second, it requires manufacturers of infant sleep products to provide consumers with prepaid registration forms to be kept on file by the uh, manufacturers. Getting to this point has presented staff with a number of challenges, which I know they're gonna describe, as new data have surfaced <laughs> regarding the hazards of infant sleep products, eventually leading to the abandonment of a narrow standard just for inclined sleep products and the expansion of the standard to include all infant sleep products, including inclined and flat products. So the draft final rule now defines infant sleep products as those marketed or intended to provide sleeping accommodations for an infant up to five months of age that are not already subject to one of five existing CPSE sleep standards. Uh, and let me note something, in the past several days, uh, I and I'm sure my fellow commissioners have received a number of emails from concerned members of the public regarding our consideration of this rule. Uh, I want to remind everyone that the official comment period for submitting comments closed some time ago, but it's long been the practice of the agency to docket even last minute submissions, uh, although staff can't comment on them formally the way they do with more timely filed comments, but they have been made part of the record. Today's session will proceed as follows. Staff will brief the commission on the draft final rule. After that, each commissioner will have five minutes to ask questions of staff with multiple rounds if necessary. The following staff members will brief the commission and I say good morning to both of them. Celestine Kish, project manager, infant sleep products from the Division of Human Factors in the Directorate of Engineering Sciences, and Mary House, attorney in the regulatory division of the Office of General Counsel. Also in attendance are Mary Boyle, CPSC Executive Director, Jen Sultan, Acting General Counsel, and Alberta Mills, CPSC Sec uh, Secretary. One final moment point before I turn the meeting over to staff, because this is a public meeting and because staff legal advice should be provided in a confidential setting, I'm gonna ask that any, any questions that address the agency's legal authority or legal justification for this rulemaking be withheld to a more appropriate moment and setting. So thank you, everybody. Welcome. I now turn the gavel over, I believe, to Celestine, and uh, we look forward to your briefing. Good morning. Actually, I'm going to speak first. Uh, good morning. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Chairman I Adler. apologize. That's okay. Uh, and commissioners, good morning. Again, my name is Mary House. I'm an attorney in the Office of the General Counsel. And Celestine Kish is here. She's the project manager. She's a senior engineering psychologist in the Division of Human Factors. And as you've already stated, we're here this morning to brief the commission on the draft final rule to establish a safety standard for infant sleep products. Next. The commission can issue the draft final rule pursuant to its authority under section 104 of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008, um, which is also known as CPSIA. Section 104 requires the commission to issue safety standards for durable infant or toddler products. And section 104F defines what a durable infant or toddler product is. It's a durable product intended for use or that may be reasonably expected to be used by children under the age of five years. 
The statute includes a list of durable infant or toddler product categories, and the commission can add categories to this list. The list already includes infant sleep products such as cribs, play yards, and bassinets and cradles. Section 104 also requires that in consultation with consumer groups, product manufacturers, and independent child product engineers and experts, the commission examine and assess the effectiveness of any voluntary standards for durable infant or toddler products. Next, the commission must promulgate consumer product safety standards that are substantially the same as the voluntary standard or more stringent than the voluntary standard if the commission determines that more stringent standards would further reduce the risk of injury associated with the product. Additionally, the commission can adopt voluntary standards either in whole or in part pursuant to section 104B4. Finally, under section 104B2, the commission must also periodically review and revise the standards issued under section 104 to ensure that such standards provide the highest level of safety for such products that is feasible. Now I'm gonna hand off to Celestine to discuss the staff's recommended draft final rule for infant sleep products. Thank you, Mary, and good morning. I'll start with some background information about this project. Staff began working with ASTM on the development of the voluntary standard for infant and kind sleep products in about 2011. And that was as a result of hammocks and other incline products not being included in the bassinet and cradle standard. In 2015, ASTM published the first version of F3118, which is the standard consumer safety specification of infant incline sleep products. Then the commission published the notice of proposed rulemaking in April of 2017 that referenced ASTM F3118-17 with one modification to the definition of accessory. ASTM agreed with the modification and published 20, in October of 2017, published F3118-17A, which is the standard we will be referring to throughout this presentation. Next. Now between the two, the two years between the NPR and the SNPR, staff identified additional fatalities associated with rocker-like incline sleep products. And the commission issued safety alerts and recalls involving infant incline sleep products. In addition, compliance, compliance staff contracted with Dr. Aaron Mannon a PhD in mechanical engineering with a biomechanics specialization. And she conducted testing to evaluate the design of inclined sleep products. Bannon's study concluded that infants in products with seat back angles greater than 20 degrees exhibited increased demand on their abdominal muscles. This could lead to increased fatigue and suffocation if an infant is unable to reposition themselves after an accidental roll from supine to prone. The Mannon study concluded that a sleep surface that is 10 degrees or less is compatible to a crib mattress surface and can be considered a safe sleep surface. Next. Staff submitted the draft SMPR package to the commission and posted it on CPSC's website in October of 2019, October 16, 2019. The following week, ASTM held their biannual F15 juvenile products subcommittee meetings, and therefore staff was able to discuss the package within multiple subcommittees, including incline sleep products, bassinets, and in-bed sleepers. The SNPR references ASTM F3118 17A with significant modifications. Next. Here's a quick overview of the draft final rule that is substantially the same as the SNPR with clarifications in response to comments. Infant sleep products are defined as products marketed or intended to provide a sleeping accommodation for an infant up to five months of age and that are not covered by a CPSC sleep standard. 
This applies to flat and inclined products, and manufacturers must test their products to confirm that the seat back and sleep surface angle is 10 degrees or less from horizontal. They also must meet the bassinet cradle mandatory standard. Next. When we talk about the CPSC sleep standards, we're talking about these five regulations, bassinet and cradle, the full-size baby cribs, non-full-size baby cribs, play yards, and bedside sleepers. So if a product intended for infant sleep already conforms to one of these sleep standards, that product is not within the scope of this draft final rule. Next. And now we have some show and tell. These are examples of products that are in the scope of F3118 17A, the voluntary standard for infant inclined sleep products. Typically, these are identified as hammocks, nappers, play yard accessories, and inclined sleepers. Next. These are products the staff considers in scope of the draft final rule. They do not meet any of the five CPSC sleep standards and yet are marketed or intended for infant sleep. They are typically identified as in-bed sleepers, travel bassinets, compact bassinets, in infant tents, baby boxes, and crib accessories. CPSC staff considers these items marketed for napping, snoozing, dreaming, or any other word that implies sleeping or that is called a bed, and items marketed with pictures of a sleeping infant to be an infant sleep product. There aren't any infant sleep voluntary or mandatory standards for which these products have to meet at this time. Next. In the draft final rule, staff responded to comments received from the 2017 NPR and the 2019 SNPR. Numerous comments on the 2019 SNPR, such as the American Academy of Pediatrics, consumer groups, individual parents expressed support for the SNPR. And, because the pro and this is because products covered in the draft final rule will be required to follow the AAP safe sleep guidelines. As you can see in this list, other commenters raise questions about the topics, such as the scope and definition to clarify which products will be covered in the final rule. They ask about the incident data and how safe sleep principles, such as bed sharing, are addressed in the final rule. Over the next few slides, I will explain how staff address the comments and how the draft final rule clarifies the SNPR. Next. First, I'll start with the data and hazard patterns. In the 2019 SNPR, staff identified 59 fatalities and 96 non-fatal injuries related to infant inclined sleep products. In this draft final rule, staff identified 10 additional fatalities and 17 non-fatal injuries. The hazard patterns are generally the same, and I'll get to that in a minute. Next. In response to the SMPR comments, staff identified 183 incidents and 11 fatalities associated with the use of unregulated flat sleep products meaning those flat products marketed for infant sleep that are not currently subject to an existing CPSC sleep standard or a voluntary standard. There were also 16 non-fatal injuries. Next. In the 2019 SNPR, staff identified hazard patterns. And although the data distribution in the draft final rule vary somewhat from the SNPR, staff finds that the broader hazard categories are very similar to the hazard categories previously identified. As you can see, the hazard categories are listed in descending order of frequency, which is 
which is not always the same as the level of severity. You may not think of consumer comments as a hazard pattern. However, after the SNPR was published, we received reports consisting of consumer comments and observations of perceived safety hazards. There were complaints about the sale of recalled infant inclined seat products, or there were, there were inquiries about the April 2019 safety, safety recalls of these products. Within the category of design, we identified 10 incidents that reported that infants rolled over fully or partially from their original supine position. The reports describe infants as young as one month of age rolling over. Parents and caregivers who witnessed and reported some of the non-fatal incidents were able to rescue a distressed infant quickly. However, other infants died due to suffocation or asphyxiation. Eight incidents reported that infants develop physical deformations such as flat head syndrome or torticollis from extended product use. And five incidents reported that infants develop respiratory ailments due to growth of mold on their products. The other product related category includes incidents related to instability, you know, products that were not completely or, or products that completely or nearly flipped over or locking and latching problems where the sleep surface failed to remain in position. One of the three instability incidents was a fatality that occurred when a foam type reclined seat tipped over and fell from the adult bed with trapping the infant under, underneath on the floor. The structural integrity category deals with reports of components breaking, such as rails or hardware, hardware or other unspecified parts. The electrical category only had one complaint and that was related to an overheating incident. Now the non-product related, an infant was placed supine in a rocking inclined sleep product with a blanket over his face and then was found deceased in that same position. Unfortunately, staff has no information on the circumstances for the five deaths in this last category. There were also two reported injuries that simply described a fall, but no other information was provided. Next. Similar to the infant inclined sleep products, the hazard patterns reported for unregulated flat infant sleep products varied according to the type and usage pattern of the product. As you can see, these are presented in descending order of frequency, but again, that doesn't necessarily relate to hazard. So first we have um, a lock and latch. Reports in this category primarily related to the locking and latching mechanism that controls the opening and closing of a, of a cover on a specific product. Some reports describe that the inability of the cover to open completely resulted in, I'm sorry, some reports describe that the inability of the cover to open completely resulted in the product not lying flat. And a report for a different product describes a foldable sleeper not remaining flat, and in that case, the unit actually folded up with the infant inside. None of these reports mentioned any injuries. Now we have more consumer comments and they're similar to the inclined sleep. They were consumers or safety advocates expressing concern about perceived safety hazards of a product, uh, non-compliance with relevant standards that a product is being labeled as, and or misleading marketing statements about a product. 7% of the reported incidents involve falls and containment. Infants falling out of the product or an infant not being kept contained within the product. For example, infants rolling out of a sleeper onto an adult bed and then onto the floor. 
Another example is an infant falling out of a sleeper when a sibling jumped on the couch where the sleeper was positioned. The one fatality in this category involved an infant crawling or, or rolling. It was unwitnessed. We don't know how the infant got out of the sleeper, but ended up being trapped between an adult bed frame and a mattress. Instability, like falls in the containment, represented 7% of the incidents. The incident reports described some products with legs lifting up higher or leaning to one side and other products having slipped off or flipped over from the adult bed or couch on which they were resting. Asphyxiation suffocation hazard. Eight of the nine incidents were fatalities due to suffocation or positional asphyxia. The ninth was a near suffocation episode because a nearby parent rescued the infant. The products were compact bassinets, travel beds, baskets, and in-bed sleepers. One of, it, one of which was being used inside a standard bassinet and another was being used inside a play yard. All but one of the infants had rolled over from their initial position, either fully or partially. For miscellaneous, this category involved incidents related to mold or complaints about the quality of the product material. And in this last category, staff could not definitive, definitively identify the issues involved. Two of the incidents were fatalities, and in both cases, the CPSC field investigation reports indicated that the cause of death is undetermined. The third incident resulted in a hospitalization due to unspecified breathing difficulties suffered by the infant. Next. So now I'll present how the 16 CFR 1218 bassinet cradle regulation addresses the hazards for inclined and flat sleep products. Dr. Mannon's study concluded that 10 degrees is likely a safe incline for sleep in, for infant sleep. And that supports the 10 degrees sleep surface stated in the scope of the bassinet and cradle standard. Tips, tip overs, balls, and containments are all very much related. The incident data identified falls and containment incidents when compact, portable products were used on an elevated surface, such as adult beds and couches. The data also demonstrated that short sides failed to contain the infant. So the bassinet standard will address falls and containments because of two requirements. One, the side height. Bassinets required that 7.5 inch side height and also the stability test. The bassinet standard stability test simulates a two-year-old male pulling on the side of the product. Incident data confirms that compact portable products are used on race surfaces from which infants and products may fall and staff concurs that sibling interaction is a reasonable scenario in which the product may tip over. Although the inclined sleep standard allowed, allowed an exemption from this stability test for compact portable products, the bassinet standard does not, and therefore requiring all infant sleep products meet the more stringent stability requirement in the bassinet standard will address these issues. The definition of a bassinet in the standard indicates a stand is required. So staff considers this another feature to, to help with stability because of the stringent stability tests required. The bassinet standard and the inclined sleep product standard have similar structural integrity testing, but the bassinet standard is slightly more stringent. The bassinet regulation has two performance requirements related to locking and latching. One deals with the unintentional folding and the other deals with ensuring removable bassinet beds attach and stay attached to the base stand requirement. 
Staff concludes these requirements will address the risk of injury associated with lock, locking and latching features on these products. The overall performance requirements in the bassinet standard are intended to address known suffocation hazards with infant sleep and create a minimal safe sleep environment. Therefore, staff is confident in recommending that all unregulated flat and inclined sleep products meet the bassinet regulation. Next. In the next two slides, I will explain staff's clarifications to the recommended SMPR modifications to ASTM F3118 17A voluntary standard. First, throughout the whole standard, staff continues to recommend removing the term incline. In the introduction, staff clarifies that known infant sleep hazards include but are not limited to seat back or sleep surface angles that are greater than 10 degrees from horizontal. The scope clearly states that flat and inclined products are included and that products that are not already subject to any of the five CPSC sleep standards are subject to this standard. In addition, there's one exempt, exemption um, listed crib mattresses that meet F2933, the voluntary standard for crib mattresses. And that standard is also added to the reference documents. Next. To ensure all infant sleep products are in scope, staff clarified the definitions by removing freestanding and generally supported by a stationary or rocking base. Staff also clarified the definition, clarified that the definition includes products that are marketed or intended to, buy, to provide sleeping accommodations for an infant up to five months. The broad definition of infant sleep product allows staff to recommend removing the definitions for accessory, compact, and newborns because they all fall within the, the infant sleep product definition. The draft final rule only has two performance requirements, essentially. One is to measure the maximum seat back sleep surface angle. This is a clarification because the sleep surface, this is a clarification that sleep surface must be measured because flat sleep surfaces do not have a seat back. So we added that clarification. And then complying with 16 CFR 1218 bassinet cradles, including the definition. So it is clear infant sleep products must have a stand to meet the performance and labeling requirements. Next. Staff assesses that a significant economic impact is possible for about 12 small importers, nine small domestic manufacturers, and hundreds of home-based small businesses. The impact is expected for companies that have non-compliant infant sleep products as a substantial portion of their product line. Next. The impact depends on the ability of small businesses to either redesign existing products and conduct third-party testing to demonstrate compliance or remarket as not intended for infant sleep or remarket for infants older than five months. However, the option to remarket has a caveat. If consumer perceptions of product use and the physical design demonstrates no other possible use except for sleep, such as with infant hammocks, compact bassinets, and in-bed sleepers, remarketing may not be an option. To reduce the impact of the draft final rule, staff recommends a 12-month effective date to give impacted manufacturers sufficient time to redesign and test their products and importers time to find compliance suppliers. Next. So to conclude, 
staff recommends the commission publish the final rule that is consistent with the SNPR. Adopt F3118 17A with substantial modifications to address all unregulated infant sleep products, inclined and flat, to make the standard more stringent to further reduce the risk of injuries associated with infant sleep products. Staff recommends keeping the effective date at 12 months after publication of the final rule, as just stated, to help reduce the potential economic impact on small businesses. Thank you, and staff is now available for questions. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Celestine and Mary. Uh, as usual, excellent presentations, very, very uh, uh, substantive and a lot of stuff to digest so I suspect uh, there'll be some questions that are asked and I have a couple of very quick questions that I'll lead with and I remind us that we will have five minutes uh, per round I'm very flexible about that usually if you've got a train of thought uh, I will usually let a commissioner uh, follow that and ask all of us to be uh, somewhat self-controlling about uh, abusing the time. Um, so I guess one immediate question is when I looked at the slide 14, there's a time frame for set the 71. And I wondered where did that number of 71 come from? Because uh, I I was I'm I'm not clear where that was that post SNPR. Uh, let me just check which one slide it was slide 14. And it's um... yes. So the 71 incidents um, were related to a new data poll that is post SNPR was pulled for this draft for the draft final rule. Okay, great. I, I I was pretty sure that was it, but I just needed to pin that down. Um, you did mention mold as an issue with a number of consumer complaints, and I've read that as well, but. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there's nothing in our standard relating to controlling mold. I'm not sure how we would do that. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, another question is, uh, Dr. Mannon's study picked 10 degrees uh, as the maximum limit. And then you also point out that Health Canada sets it at seven degrees and Australia at five degrees. Uh, and I guess just to put it on the record, is there something they know that we don't or um, were we following the, the, the science with Dr. Manning? Um, it's actually a multiple thing, multiple issues. Um, we were following Dr. Manning, um, but also the seven degrees um, in Health Canada was actually, and uh, in Australia, was uh, a side to side angle where Dr. Manning was looking at the head to toe angle. And so um, we went with. The, the 10 degrees and and again also it was already in our bassinet standard was 10 degrees yeah it would always seem to me that the the side to side would be taken care of unless that somebody's got bad quality control so i i do understand that um i did have a question uh that may be a little unrelated to what is going on with this specific standard but i did see that staff excluded sleep wedge pillows and sleep positioners from the standard and I just am wondering, I thought we had some issues with those products. And so is it because they don't present a hazard or is it because that if we're going, they're gonna be addressed, it will be addressed outside of the infant sleep products uh, standard? So um, CPSC and FDA have actually both acknowledged the hazards of sleep positioners um, and have uh, advised consumers not to use them. Um, but they also don't meet the definition as proposed in this final rule for infant sleep product because they're actually used in conjunction with something else. They're not a they're not a sleep product all by themselves. Yeah, and the one thing, if you recall, and I'm sure you do, because we were inundated with complaints about setting the angle so that kids who are suffering from acid reflux uh, wouldn't be able to take advantage of the inclined sleepers. And I'm I'm amazed to see that there might still be products that are sold as medical devices to address uh, acid reflux. And I guess the question is, are there really products like that on the market today? 
because uh, I, I can't say that I've heard of them, although I'm not uh, immersed in FDA medical device regulation. There are products out there. I actually don't know if they meet the definition of a medical device. Um, so there are, unfortunately, still sleep positioners available, um, but that's the extent of my knowledge on them. Okay, well, that's much more than my knowledge. Um, so at this point, I'm going to stop my questioning. I will uh, have further questions to ask, but now uh, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Kay to see if he has any questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to staff, uh, Ms. Aff and Ms. Kish. I wanted to start, please, Ms. Kish, on the age range. And so first, a clarification. When staff proposes up to five months, if uh, an infant is five months and a day, does that mean that that um, is outside the scope? Typically, ASTM standards and our regulations say uh, up to five months. And so to answer your question, I would say it could include children through five months it could include children up to the very minute they turn five months it's it has to do more with their developmental abilities and so um it's it's within that five month range i don't think a, uh, a manufacturer would market their product um to say five months and older or five, it, it, it's a close five months. <laughs> I don't know how, I'll, how else to answer that. Yeah, and, and the reason I ask is, as you point out, there are other standards, of course, where the upper age limit is delineated. And this has come up, for instance, in the tip overs context with age five and whether that includes children that are over than five before six. And so uh, I'm just wondering, how folks would understand and it does seem like there's some gray area in there for children who might be between five months and a day and the end of five months and, and as you mentioned marketing doesn't usually i'm not aware of marketing usually including that age range but i'm just wondering if there's a gap between things that might be zero to five and things marketed for six up so that's i guess at this point more of a comment uh, in terms of the ASTM process, can you just walk, and you obviously, you guys did a good job of this in the package, but could you walk us through during this briefing, please, a little bit more about how much consultation there was and specifically on both parts of it, both the, what we used to call incline products and then also what you're calling flat products? Um, sure. So, even before CPSIA um, went into effect, staff was um, working um, in the ASTM process, um, developing standards or renewing standards. Uh, once CPSIA went into effect and these 104 rules, then um, we had to start working towards making them regulations. The staff was very active in um, the voluntary standards and had been consulting and participating in the, the actual development of the inclined sleep standard because it didn't even exist um, originally before CPSA. And that, that came about because, um, again, it was, they weren't included in the bassinet standard. Um, so staff has been very active in participating in all of these um, voluntary standards, bassinets, in-bed sleepers, um, inclined sleepers, and cribs, and, and all of the five regulations that we talk about. And at what point did flat products um, become something that you were actively consulting on? So because the bassinet standard was actually trying to create um, uh, a new section within it for compact bassinets, we were very active, we are and still are very active in the bassinet development and talking about um, the compact bassinets, which are the flat. Um, and then 
there was a lot of discussion within ASTM about um, in-bed sleepers, whether they should be in the bassinet standard as part of the compact group or if they should be their own. And ASTM decided that they were going to try and separate in-bed sleepers into its own standard. And so that's why they're working on, there's a group working to make that regulation. So it's all been coming out of um, and going between the, the bassinet standard. I see. And presumably CPSC staff has been very active in these discussions uh, the whole time and sharing data. Is that accurate? That is accurate, yes. And if it turns out that the commission adopts this rule, is there anything that precludes ASTM from continuing its work and uh, at some point creating its own standards that we might consider for these products? Um, absolutely, they can do that. I mean, part of the um, 104, CPSC 104 rule says that um, we can take a look at these um, standards and um, if ASTM presents something that um, we, we will review it and consider it for renewing or updating any of the regulations that we have. Got it. Thanks so much. I have no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Commissioner Biacco, your questions or comments? Yes, thank you. Um, going third uh, is going to make me jump around a little bit, um, so I, I apologize for that. And I do agree with Bob. There's a lot in here to digest. Um, I know there was a lot of work that went into this package. And candidly, I'm struggling with organizing it in my own mind. So some of my questions um, actually go to that. Um, just to follow up on something that Bob asked, because I had written the same thing down. So we don't have anything to do with mold. So the incidents dealing with mold, we should take those out of our numbers, right? I mean, we had a couple incidents that we were looking at that dealt with mold, right? So the mold came up because there was one product that had a large number of complaints involving mold, and that company actually recalled their product because of the mold issue. Um, we do still occasionally get comments on it, but um, we really have um, not included that in any, ASTM or CPSC has not included okay. that in any standard. So, so, so to the extent we have the incidents that include mold, we should take them out of our numbers here. Because I'm trying to sort through the numbers. I have a bunch of questions on the numbers. Okay. Um, Let's talk about the pre-market approval that I've seen a couple times um, throughout here, um, throughout the package. What, can you explain to me um, why we would recommend um, pre-market approval and where that authority comes from? Because I'm aware that the FDA has pre-market pre authority or pre-market approval authority for medical devices. I'm not aware of any uh, authority like that that applies to the CPSC. Can you help me find that? So we do not have free market approval. Um, not, I'm not sure where you, you um, saw that in the package because um, we have these regulations and manufacturers are required to comply, but we do not provide free market approval. But that is one of the recommendations um, in the package. And I know I'll get a chance to come back around, so I'll find that specifically. But I, I had written that down a couple times that we were um, basically um, abandoning, in some regards, the rulemaking standards um, under the ASTM and, and in favor of a pre-market approval approach. So I was just trying to figure out how we got there. Okay, so I think... I think that may have been in the comments that staff received, um, that some of the comments um, suggested that's what we were doing, but that is not how CPSC um, regulations work. We do not have require pre-approval. We do not provide pre-approval. Okay. I'm, I'm going to come back to that because I, I know I read that somewhere. We, okay. uh, when, when we um, re we relied on Dr. Mannon's study for this, 
for this analysis? So Dr. Mannon's study helped us with um, addressing the incline angle because but the, the initial well, there are they were yeah. So Dr. Mannon's study was looking at the incline angle because the infant incline sleep standard allowed between 10 and 30 degrees, and so that's what her study was addressing. The other products um, are already flat, so less, most likely less than 10 degrees. But she didn't study. Dr. Mannon didn't study the the other products that were sort of. I, I call it dumping into this particular bassinet standard by this rule. I mean, she didn't study um, you know, in, in bed sleepers or you showed us a bunch of pictures. She was really a retained, I, I understand, to do an analysis on the um, incline degrees, correct? Correct. She was she was looking at the incline. Okay. And and her, do you know whether her study has been peer reviewed or or it's just Dr. Mannon's study? Uh, Dr. Mannon's study has she has published um, several articles. I, uh, you know what, I'm going to have to get back to you. I don't know the exact okay. answer, so I don't want to mislead fine. you. So I will get back to you on that. So is there a reason why we didn't hold a um, uh, like a forum to talk about and get uh, comments uh, regarding why this um, this uh, rule should include flat uh, infant sleep products because I, I think that under section 104 it says the commission shall consult with representatives of consumer groups juvenile product manufacturers and independent child product engineers and so forth and so forth um, and to talk about a voluntary standard is there a reason we didn't do that here because I know we do a lot of forms one of the things that I'd like to caution is just going into a, a line of inquiry that might draw some um, inappropriate for the public responses. So I just want to um, caution against that at this time. Okay, but I'm not asking anything that would be inappropriate. I'm asking why we didn't consider or, or, or whether we would consider um, hearing from other groups uh, through a forum. I can get back to you on that. I don't. Okay, um, yeah, I'll I'll get back to you on that. Okay, I'm I'm sure I'm I'm done with my five minutes, so I'll I'll let people move on and try to reorganize here. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Commissioner Biacco. I I'm gonna make a stab at the pre-market approval, and I see Mary House is there, so she can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we don't have pre-market approval of products. We don't have the authority to do that. And actually, FDA doesn't have the authority to do pre-market approval other than for the, the class one uh, products under medical devices. What we have is what I call quasi pre-market approval. When we have one of these 104 regulations, then before companies can market their products, they have to get third party certification. So that was a compromise, if I understand correctly, when they drafted CPSIA between giving us pre-market approval uh, and, and not having any sort of authority. So what we have is this third party certification. And I look to uh, attorney Mary House to correct me if I've misstated that. You're good. I don't know about the compromise part, but um, right, I mean, we, uh, we don't have third party approval. We have the authority to regulate and set performance and labeling requirements for durable infant or toddler products. So that's what the rule does. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna turn to uh, Commissioner Feldman. Uh, your questions and comments, please. Thank you. Um, and, and I wanna thank staff for their hard work on this rulemaking. Uh, based on the length of the draft rule, it's clear that, that an awful lot of work has gone into this project. And the issues that we're discussing here today are, are important, uh, but they're also complex. Uh, protecting infants, uh, frankly, it, it's, it's a key reason why we all stood up and raised our hands to serve the American uh, people in, in this capacity. Um, so it's important that we get this right. Um, I, I do have several questions. Uh, they, they almost entirely relate to the legal analysis provided in the legal memo uh, dated May 14th, 2021. And given that my questions relate to the legal analysis and the conclusions that uh, uh, the acting general counsel has reached, I believe that that discussion needs to take place. 
separate from the public discussion that we're having here uh, to preserve confidentiality. Um, so I, I guess I do have the advantage of going last. Uh, uh, pursuant to the decision-making procedures, I, I would request that we enter executive session uh, so that we can discuss the legal issues and analysis uh, that are associated with the final rule. Um, do you, uh, I, I hadn't been alerted that that was uh, something that you had in mind, but we can certainly have staff consult with you about your legal questions. I'm not sure going into executive session is the appropriate uh, thing to do at this point. Well, but th This uh, matter involves complex matters of, of both fact and law as evidenced by the lengthy legal memo that we received. It's 27 pages. The memo mm -hmm. raises serious and significant questions and, and issues that we as a commission should consider as a commission prior to moving forward with the final rule. Uh, you know, having an opportunity to consult with staff is great, but, but that really makes this then just half a briefing. Well, it makes it half a briefing for you. I'm not sure it is the same for the rest of us, and I certainly believe that you should get your questions answered. I'm not sure that uh, going into post executive session uh, is is the way to do that, but let me think about that for a second. But, but uh, doing it that way uh, and, and not and not going into executive session, one, uh, under the, the DMPs, if any commissioner wishes to discuss a confidential or legal information related to an agenda item during a public commission, the commissioner shall request to enter the executive briefing session. The commission then shall enter a closed executive briefing session upon such a request. So I, this 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 certainly isn't uh, isn't out of the norm. Well, it it actually may be out of the norm, but they may be consistent with the decision making procedures. And uh, as I think about it, I, I have no problem with going into a uh, a brief uh, executive session after we complete the public session. So uh, Thank please. You. Muster your questions, and uh, you should be able to uh, ask I'll them. I'll for a second round if if, uh, if 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 that's what the rest of the commission wants to do. Okay, well that that's fine. I do have some additional questions. Um, I noticed that uh, staff hypothesized that the number of households with newborns that own in bed sleepers could be as high as 25 percent, which represents about a million units a year. Uh, and I. <laughs> Based on the comments, I have no doubt that lots of people bed share, but I'm surprised that the large estimate of the people who actually buy and put kids into sleepers. Uh, I know these are numbers you're you're contemplating. They're not numbers we've derived, but I'm curious. Do you really think there are that many in-bed sleepers that are sold every year? I am actually going to ask Susan Proper, who is um, our economics um, representative on the team, to answer that question. So if we can get her on camera. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, in 10 seconds or less, I don't mean to dwell on it, but I was curious. Okay, so yeah, we're, that's a pretty good estimate because we came at it three different ways, as you'll see in the briefing package. Uh, a public commenter said that the units sold were half a million to 1.5 million, which was consistent with CDC and our own durable product survey on exposure on how many people said that they bed shared. Okay, that's really fascinating. Shows, uh, you know, my, my son is almost 40 years old and life has moved on and so infant products have. Uh, I did want to talk about uh, the bed sharing because I think you saw we got a number of comments from people who feel very, very strongly about bed sharing. And, uh, on page 115 in the briefing package, you cite a study uh, from the UK about the reasons why parents bed share. Uh, and I thought those were exactly spot on the reasons that friends of mine who bed share, who are willing to admit it, why they did that. Uh, and so I, I see the benefits of bed sharing, but one of the reasons staff is so cautious about these in-bed sleepers is because of the hazards. And Celestine, would you mind sort of walking us through what you identified as some of the hazards of bed sharing as opposed to bedside sleepers? Sure, sure. So the data in the briefing package included incidents involving um, infant sleep products. Um, and what we found is that um, there are, are numerous bed sharing deaths that occur in adult beds. Um, 
such as over, overlay desks, um, soft and loose bedding, suffocation in pillows, and bed mattress, adult mattresses or entrapments. So that's that's this general category of bed sharing. And now that it don't all involve in bed sleepers. It's just the the whole um, bed sharing data that we're aware of. Um, and that not all of that data was in the package because we were focused on the products. But we know that these deaths occur. Um, and therefore, um, you can see in, in the data in the Epi memo that these products um, tipped over and fell out of the bed, um, that they didn't contain the child and the child was able to get out of the product and suffocate. Um, products were rolling over and found in prone positions. So these are um, these are the hazards that we see um, in bed sharing with and without uh, an in bed sleeper. Yeah, and uh, just to follow up, uh, it does seem to me that a well constructed, uh, very close bedside sleeper would provide a lot of the same benefits that the in bed sleepers. Uh, it is do we have any studies i don't even know what they would say that show the benefits of bedside sleepers you know um i'm not really aware of any studies about bedside sleepers but um that is definitely staff's position that um a bedside sleeper gives the infant their own space but right next to the bed um the baby is no longer between both parents the baby has own space right next to one parent on the side and that's certainly um, the direction that staff recommends um, for parents who who want to bed share we understand clearly we understand that there is a large population of people who want to bed share and that's why we offer up the bedside sleeper as an option yeah, intuitively it makes sense to me that the bedside sleeper would provide a lot of the same uh, benefits uh, those are uh, my questions uh, for the moment. Uh, Commissioner Kay, follow-up questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Kish, I just wanted to follow up on one of the exchanges you had with Commissioner Biacco about the consultation. And Commissioner Biacco read the language in Section 104 about the requirement to consult and the various parties with whom we are supposed to consult and required to consult, and then asked why we hadn't done a forum I just want to clarify that the consultation that uh, it has existed factually, that's the ASTM process. Is that correct? Meaning the same process we, we have followed with regard to consultation from the beginning of CPSIA, that's the process that was followed here? Correct. Absolutely. Staff has been very active in the ASTM um, meetings and um, development. Thank you. And then on the pre-market approval process, just to make it clear, there's nothing in the package that staff is recommending on pre-market approval. What you're talking about is the response to comments, meaning some of the commenters uh, have viewed this proposal as pre-market approval and staff is saying that's not accurate. That has That is the context in which pre-market approval has arisen in this package. Is that right? I believe that is correct. I, I'm going to look into that and make sure that I and provide a full answer to that, but I believe that is correct. That is correct. We, clearly, received, we received a comment on right. that and we answered it. Okay, thank you, Ms. House. I have nothing else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just one additional comment on that because um, I read a study several years ago in which they surveyed consumers and they said, do you believe the government actually requires pre-market approval for children's products and toys in particular? And a huge percentage of the population says, of course, the government requires pre-market approval, which shows many a slip twixt the cup and the lip between public expectations and what, what the commission's actual authority is. Commissioner Biacco, additional questions and comments, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so one, what I think that is bothering me, and I, I'm sorry if I didn't articulate it correctly or better than that, it seems to me that if, um, if a group of infant sleep products do if they do not um fit within this proposed rule preemptively we are banning um banning a large group of products when you agree with that 
what we are trying to do is require that these products on the market meet a safety standard. And as of right now, there are mark there are products that are on the market that do not meet any safety standards. And kind of getting to what Bob was saying, consumers assume um, that if the product is on the market, it has been tested and, and is safe. And, okay. and, and, and I understand that, but that that's not what we're talking about here. And that's not what the rules are. Our rules are, uh, you know, the statute and, and, and so forth. And what I'm concerned about is that the, I think the reason we got so many comments on the uh, bed sharing and bedside and, and so forth is because the rule went, so, the proposed rule went so much further than anybody expected there was a, a large reaction, and I think from users as well as um, produ uh, uh, producers, uh, they felt that they were, if this rule went through, they were going to be told, A, they couldn't market their products, B, they were banned, C, they couldn't use their products. And I, and I think that that's what I'm struggling with here with this particular um, presentation. And you, know, you had mentioned we've been sharing data, but what data? I mean, I, when I went through here, everything we have is anecdotal, right? I mean, we say that on page 41, that the draft final rule was based on anecdotal data. And I think it also said, we, we don't have any data on uh, in-bed sleepers and, and uh, next-to-bed sleepers. So, uh, so I'm having trouble understanding how we went so far um, from the bassinet standard to swoop in a bunch of things that A, we don't have any data on, and B, will, if they don't comply with this broad standard, they'll be banned. And we don't have any data that certainly uh, would demonstrate that we have enough information to require a ban on a product. I think that's what I'm struggling with. And if you can help me clear that up, that, that's that's terrific. But that's, the, that's what I keep getting bogged down with. Okay, um, I will try. And I may also call in my friend, Rosanna, who does, who's with our EPI, who does all our data. But I, the first thing I want to say is that we absolutely do have data. Um, as you can see from the briefing package, we have um, 11 deaths in flat, unregulated products. Um, so we do we do have the data that shows these products um, are are um, hazardous. Um, 11 out of how many? I thought there's 10. So Rosanna, um, Steve, can you can you um, get Rosanna camera and mic on? Sorry. I know she can go to the data much faster than I can. <laughs> just, just tell me, you know, because I'm looking on. I think the the I think I'm looking at the inclines, but on these uh, on the on the flat products, there's 11 fatalities during what period? And based on you know, was I think you said there was one where the child had. The, the blanket over their face. I mean, even if we had 10, I, I'm not sure that's enough to ban, preemptively ban a product. Well, and, and I would say we're not, we're not banning the products. We're asking, we're telling them how to um, redesign their products so that it meets these minimal safety standards that we know um, as for, that are in bassinets. Um, so we know that bassinets meet requirements that have um, addressed these hazards previously. And so that's why the bassinet standard is what staff is recommending. And, and I understand that, but the, the in-bed sleepers and the side sleepers, a lot of these products aren't bassinets. So to ask them to take their product and redesign it into something that fits into your standard still has the same effect that they can't sell the product as is, now they have to change it and get into a different a, a different line of business, if you will. Well, we are changing it for the safety of the infants, <laughs> so. Well, I, under, I understand that, but, and, and you know, but please understand, I'm not trying to like beat you up here. I'm just trying to understand how we got so far. I was surprised when I read the package, how broad it got, and I, I just, I, I I didn't see the breakdown or the the support from Dr. Mann, and I didn't see any of that done with regard to the products that I saw dumped in. 
And I'll ask one more question on the bedside sleepers um, and, and, and let somebody else talk, but I didn't see anything in here, um, but I did get a lot of comments from people who um, were very upset over this proposed rule that would, would stop them from effectively bed sharing. And I would think that that would affect a particular um, socioeconomic group um, and I wondered if we looked at that. I mean, there are some groups that that would affect more than others, um, maybe disproportionately, and I didn't see that addressed in here. I don't know if, if I missed it. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm I'm getting your question correctly. The in bed sleepers, which are used um, by bed sharing families. Mm -hmm. They, they may or may not be used. I mean, bed sharing families may choose not to use anything. And um, just like AAP, staff agrees that that is a potentially hazardous um, sure. scenario. And so what staff is recommending is they use it for the top choice for me is just to say a, a bedside sleeper, which meets one of our regulations and is very similar to a bassinet actually because it has to meet the bassinet standard so um in bed sleepers are the concern because the infant because those products do not meet any regulation okay i think All right. i hope that I'll, answers I'll your it, it doesn't but um uh, i'll let somebody else go next well, I, I saw try Nathana, and come back. I'm um, sorry, I saw Nathana come on. Uh, um, if she's still available, if she had a quick uh, bit of information she could share, that would be fine. If not, we'll move to Commissioner Feldman. Uh, sure. The yeah, products. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Susan. Sure. The the products that are covered in in the scope of this rule overlap the prices for compliant products. For example, a bedside sleeper sells for as little as $100. The range of prices for some of the other, for the products covered by this rule start at about 50, go up to about 200. So there's a lot of overlap in the prices between the products covered by this rule and existing products that are compliant with the existing standards. So I, I understand that too. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking here, and I don't mean to be rude on my phone. I had a comment from a parent who was very upset, basically saying, I, if you put this rule in place, you're basically coming into my home and we bed share in my home. This is what's best for us. This is what we can afford. And um, you know, this rule would, would necessarily impact that negatively. And my question is, did we look at whether some of the um, underserved communities or whether the uh, diverse communities would be hit harder by this rule than others. And I, it just seemed to me, based on that, um, the, the comments I received, that could be an issue. And I don't want to see that happen either. And that's fine. If we didn't do it, that's fine. I, you know, I just, just wondered uh, based on that comment. Uh, well, thank you very much for that question comment. It looks like Dwayne Bonfess wanted to uh, weigh in for a second. Yes, and I'm uh, doing somewhat a little bit on behalf of uh, uh, Rosanna, who had some audio difficulties. Okay. Uh, with the last question first uh, about looking at the uh, the availability of products and, and so forth, we we did take a look at uh, uh, at that issue. Uh, we know that there was uh, extensive interest in uh, the in bed sleepers as a and uh, for example, baby boxes is another example of. Uh, very inexpensive products that uh, that could be acquired. We took a look to make sure that the uh, and captured in the uh, uh, in the staff briefing package is discussions of that uh, as what what Susan was mentioning that overlap. We found many products, uh, for example, on the bedside uh, sleepers that were uh, at or below uh, uh, infant sleep or uh, in bed sleeper prices. Okay, I'm not talking about prices though, Dwayne. I'm talking about if you if a if a product doesn't fit into this standard, it is going to be you can argue the point, but effectively banned. And if somebody can, is is not able to get a product, there the prices don't matter. If they want a particular product that doesn't meet the standard that they're using now or a practice that they're using now, they won't have any access to any to. They'll have to go to something else. 
And, and that was my concern. Okay. And I think you've articulated that very well. I'm gonna turn now to Commissioner Feldman. Uh, do you have a quick additional questions or comments? I do, and as I said earlier, most of my questions uh, I would like to address in uh, in, in closed uh, uh, executive session, and I'm, I'm glad that we're going to turn to that after after we're done in open session. Um, uh, but maybe, maybe if we have the technical capability, I still have to ask Steve McGugan uh, how we would do that. But well, yes, we've had the technical capability to do any number of of uh, closed briefings previously, so I don't see that. Well, yeah, I don't doubt that. I'm just saying, given the exact platform that we're using right now, uh, it might be that he would have to send a new invitation uh, for us to join in a separate executive session, and we just That's need right. to consult with him. But 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 again, uh, to 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 circle back to Dana's line of questioning here, I'm still not hearing uh, an answer to this specific question. Did staff look at socio-economic uh, and cultural considerations and the impact of the of the final rule uh, on those? And, and if so, what did you look at, and where are those findings? Um, I would say that we will get back to you with more information on that because I I don't want to overspeak, uh, misspeak. Um, so I I will get back to you with that answer. Okay, so that's a yes or a no? We looked at a variety of things and that's what I just don't, I don't want to misspeak and say the wrong thing right now. So I, I will prepare an answer and provide that for you. Okay, I appreciate that. And I look forward to, to, to seeing that response. Um, following up on a question, a line of questioning that, that Commissioner Kay uh, 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 was engaged in, in in the first round. Um, listen, I, I understand that CPSC and staff has been in, in, in engaged with ASTM uh, in, in the in the subcommittee on on a, a a rolling basis, an ongoing basis for some time now. Um, but I also didn't hear an answer to the specific question of you know exactly when the discussion shifted from inclined sleep to flat product. When did that mm -hmm. shift occur? Well, um, I would say, as we addressed in the SMPR, when we, when staff recommended and the commission published the SMPR, the, throughout the package, we, we said we were removing the term incline because the incline was the hazard and therefore we were removing the incline and including all products that were for infant sleep that did not meet one of the five CPSC regulations. Okay. So that was um, clearly stated in the in the SMPR by removing the term incline and including all products that were not currently addressed by the five sleep standards. So those discussions occurred after the SNPR issue? They were in the SMPR. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. Yeah. No, yeah, I think you answered the question. Ask that again, Peter. I, I, I missed that. Ask that again. Whether or not the, the conversation with ASTM pivoted from inclined to uh, to When to, did that happen? Uh, sleep product. When, when did that happen? And uh, I'm, I'm being told that that happened after the SMPR issue. Um, again, uh, if I could uh, jump ahead. in. So I, I, uh, we, as uh, Ms. Kish noted earlier in the presentation, we had been working with ASTM for many, many years on a range of products, including not just the incline sleep products, but also a number of the flat sleep products, including oh, uh, some of the products such as baby boxes and so forth. So we have been engaged for multiple years uh, with ASTM and the, uh, uh, and the community at large on not just the incline, but also the flat sleep products. But the, the pivot with respect to, uh, to, to CPSC's involvement and, and uh, uh, rulemaking on our end really took, took a pivot in the ASTM discussions after the, the uh, uh, SNPR issue. That, that, that makes sense. I understand that. Um, and I understand that the conversations with, with ASTM have been on a, a rolling, ongoing basis and have covered any manner of safe sleep. Yes? 
Uh, it, they certainly have covered any manner of safe sleep. And, and I think that you are correct that when the commission published uh, the, S, the supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking, it signaled a change in that regulatory approach from what would have been proposed in the NPR, which was focused mm -hmm. on inc inclined sleepers to again, encompass uh, the broader range of products. That makes sense. Um, I, and I wanna be respectful of time. Um, we've had any number of, of, of stakeholder forums on the incline sleep issue, yes. Have we had a, a, a CPSC stakeholder forum that, that focused on, on, on flat? So Peter, Peter, may I jump in here because you're asking, course, Dana. I think you're asking the same question I was trying to ask and Ms. Kish, I think helped. When you mentioned we removed the incline, and that was done after the SNPR was issued. The SNPR asked for comments on incline, not removing the term incline. So we really haven't gotten comments or pub public comments or input on the removing the incline part, I, I think is what happened. And that's why I'm struggling with that issue. Is that well, right? In the SNPR, we did specifically ask questions about how um, the term infant sleep product would impact other products um, besides the inclined sleep products. So we, we did ask a number of questions related to the flat products. Okay. Is, is that right. what you mean? But, but, but our SNPR included incline. We didn't remove the concept of incline until after that was already issued. So the if SNPR, I might, that, that, that was, was the purpose of the SNPR. Yeah, if I might, that was an issue specifically raised in the SNPR. So I think if the issue is the legal sufficiency, I'm quite comfortable that the legal sufficiency has been met. But if I understand- but I, No, it's not legal sufficiency saying, that I'm a, challenging. Yeah, as a policy all. matter, did we, did we uh, hold uh, sufficient consultation, and that's something that I know staff is constantly consulting on. But that that's a, a something that uh, you can get back to us on. But but you but you re uh, which what I'm struggling with is I think Ms. Kish said they removed the term incline after the SNPR was issued, right? No, the SNPR is where we remove the term incline. That's the whole um, pack, SNPR package. That was the basis. It was removing inclined and including all fleet products that were not already covered by one of the five regulations. And, and I'll just supplement that, that there are a number of comments and responses, and I'll point to comments uh, four through seven or so that, that get at this issue uh, in, in some detail. Well, they get at the issue, but that's different than sweeping all other sleep products into this role. That there are two different things there. But uh, sorry, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm gonna let. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, the, these are issues that couldn't be fully discussed when we commission comes to a vote, and there are certainly issues that can be explored further. And uh, uh, thank you for raising the issue. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, uh, we've got. Uh, any and all questions that commissioners want to ask during uh, this this briefing? I, I still had uh, 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 just two more questions, uh, and, sure. and I'll be brief. Um, so, uh, following up on on one of Dana's earlier questions with respect to the the, the Manon study, um, uh, Ms. Kish, I know that you promised that you'd get back to us with whether or not it had been peer reviewed. Um, in doing that, can you also provide a, a list of who was on the peer review committee? I will, I, will, I will include that if I can get that from Dr. Manon. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and finally, when we're talking about flat products, um, I, I, admittedly, uh, not being a parent, these are uh, some products that I, I'm, I'm not intimately familiar with, uh, but I'm looking at the product descriptions and some of the photos that you've included, uh, and it, it seems fairly comprehensive in the package that you put together, so thank you. Um, but when we're talking about hammocks and in-bed sleepers and some of these uh, other other products. Is, is there anything here that sort of falls in the category of, of just being textile products, that it's, it's sort of fabric and batting as opposed to something more rigid and structural like a bassinet? Uh, 
I'm sorry, you, you broke up just at the important part. Could you repeat that? Are there any anything... in reviewing in reviewing uh, the the product descriptions and some of the photos that that uh, that, that you provided? You know, my, my my question is: Is there anything here uh, when we're talking about hammocks or 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 in bed sleepers that fall into the category of uh, sort of purely uh, 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 textile products that um, you know, that are fabric and batting as opposed to something rigid and structural like a bassinet. So I would say that in the hundreds of um, home-based manufacturers, there are a wide variety of in-bed sleepers that come with all types of materials. Um, so I'm, I don't want to say they all are, but I'm sure that there are products out there that um, could just be a fabric with um, some kind of uh, puffy side or pillowy right. side that that they have created. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, again, as I said, I, I do have further questions, but uh, they're not appropriate for open session. So. Again, uh, Ms. Kish and, and Dwayne and Mary, uh, thank you all for, for the presentation. Uh, uh, for, for now, I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I want to make sure, uh, Commissioner Kay, Commissioner Bianco, any additional questions at this point? Thank well, you, Mr. I Chairman. Have a, I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner Bianco. I was just going to say, I have a lot of questions, but I don't think that the list is appropriate for this particular thing. I think we're going to have to round up a different way. Sorry, Elliot. It's okay. There will be additional uh, time for additional questions before we actually turn to a vote on this. And so I'm, I'm certain we staff will be able to answer your questions. Uh, Thank you. Let me tell you uh, how delighted I am at the briefing that you've given us, Celestine. That's a, a grueling uh, uh, morning to spend, and I think you did a really terrific job. So yeah. thank you so much for that. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mary House for all the incredible work you put in uh, in helping develop these packages uh, and making sure they're legally sufficient. Um, what I want to do now is uh, see if Jen Sultan is available. So if we were to move to executive session, I have two questions. First of all, how do we do it technically? And secondly, Jen, if we were to do that, Commissioner Feldman had not raised the prospect of moving to executive session before, so I hadn't thought this through. Is is that something we need to take a vote on in order to move to uh, executive session? And then I'm going to ask Steve McGugan uh, what the what the technicality, the the technical challenges of doing that are. So um, for what it's not... worth, Dwayne just sent around a a notice for a session at one. The problem with that is I have a different, I have another call at one. So I think if we're able to do it, it's just a matter of when we do it. Uh, yeah, uh, well, that, that gets into a whole question of logistics. Steve McGugan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Can't Steve, we just, just in terms, well, I haven't heard from Jen Sultan. Uh, is that something that we need to take a vote to do, or is that something we can just automatically move to uh, an executive session? I hate to I put to, you on the spot. Yeah, I have to admit that I'm still trying to figure that out, but it doesn't appear um, at least directly addressed in the DMPs as far as a vote. Uh, so I, you know, I can't if there's a if there's an agreement to move into an executive session that seems sufficient. Okay, well that I hearing no objection, and I look for any objections to moving to executive session. Okay, well then, uh, if it requires an affirmative vote, I, I'm sure you can let us know. And unfortunately, uh, if Commissioner Bianco is unable to join us at one o'clock, Steve McGugan, uh, can you tell me what the technical challenge would be of moving to uh, uh, what it is? It's 11:25, uh, something can we just like. Do it now. 11:45 to. Uh, would that give you sufficient time, Commissioner Bianco? We, yeah, I just have to be on a one o'clock call. So I, I was just okay. hoping to stay on this and move to. Yeah, if session. not, if not, then I suppose we could schedule an executive session for a different time. But Steve McGugan, can you help us set up for a uh, an executive session that's closed? I don't think that's technically. Yes. 
Okay, so you, you will send around an invitation to join, uh, and I'm going to pick a time at 11.45 so that we can move to executive session? Correct. Okay. Correct, I will do. Thank you. Okay, all right. So, uh, again, thank you all for joining us for this public session, um, and thank the staff once again for a really, really excellent job, and I know it's been a grueling morning, but you acquitted yourselves extremely. Thank you. Okay, so I'll see everybody at 11.45. Thank you.